Well, welcome everyone. My name is Paul Gannett and I am going to be uh, running this webinar today for you. Um, with so many choices for water level logging out there, it can get confusing and uh, I'm hopefully going to help make it a little bit easier for you to choose the uh, products, the solutions that are best for, for your needs. Let's see. This is for those that aren't hearing me. A couple things to check. Hopefully all of you are hearing me. So uh, if you have any questions at any time, you can uh, type them into the questions box and I'll be watching that. Um, if it's appropriate at the time, I'll cover the questions then, or if uh, I think it's better to address later on in the presentation, I'll, I'll save them for later. But uh, feel free to send me questions at any time. I appreciate those. I'm planning on this webinar lasting about 60 minutes in total. I'm guessing the slides will take roughly 45, 50 minutes, um, and then I'll leave 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And whatever we don't get to during the, the webinar, we can follow up with you afterwards. And, and if there's any very specific uh, questions, of course, we'll, we'll follow up uh, with you on those as well. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will uh, be made available to all of you afterwards. So um, you don't have to take notes, although cer certain points uh, you wanna keep track of, uh, feel free to make notes as we go. So just a little bit of a brief introduction uh, uh, to me. Um, I'm the product line manager for Onset's environmental products. I've been with Onset for 24 years now and it's gone by fast. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Uh, and I've worked with the engineers to develop all of our water level loggers that we'll be talking about today. Uh, we introduced our first uh, U20 uh, water level loggers back in uh, 2005. Um, during uh, the time of developing those and supporting those, uh, I've had a chance to talk with uh, many users like, uh, like you, uh, maybe even some of you that are attending today. And um, so today's webinar is, is hopefully going to address a lot of the questions that I've addressed and uh, I've heard over the years, share some of, the, some of that experience with you. And uh, that's a little bit about me, but I'd like to get to know a little bit about you. So I have a couple of poll questions just to, uh, to get things warmed up here. So first off, I'm going to ask uh, what kind of uh, water you're monitoring. So I'm going to launch it and it's going to show a little different screen. So you can get a chance to uh, click the boxes that uh, uh, apply to you. So if you could take a second and click on the boxes uh, next to the choices. You can check multiple types of water if you're monitoring uh, multiple types of water, which is pretty common. Okay, it's looking pretty good. So it uh, gives me a good sense. Uh, no, no big surprises so far. So let me, uh, not to cut anybody off, but I'm gonna close this and share the results. So everybody can see. And uh, looks like groundwater and streams of surface water are pretty much uh, tied up around 60%. We've got some of you that are doing coastal waters. That's good. We're, we're on Cape Cod here. Uh, so we, we're surrounded by uh, the coast. So I can, can relate to your work. Uh, irrigation, important as we manage our resources, around 20% and stormwater systems. So got a good, uh, good mix. So uh, thank you for those. Um, uh, those responses. Now I'm going to go down to my next question, which is, uh, what's your experience with water level loggers? Uh, and there is no wrong answer. So let's, uh, let me give you that. And I'll launch that. So if you can just quickly let me know um, where you're at, it'll give me a sense. All right, a pretty even distribution overall. That's uh, that's good to see. So uh, yeah, we'll have something for everyone. <laughs> so I'll give you another second. Close that. Now share the results. 
and uh, about half of you have used standalone uh, loggers. Uh, about a third uh, have used remote uh, water level loggers. Good. Uh, about another half have used uh, hobo loggers. So uh, thank you. We appreciate using our loggers. Hopefully they've, they've done well for you. And uh, almost a quarter of you have not used data loggers. So uh, uh, I think this will be especially valuable uh, uh, for you uh, folks to help get you started as to what some of the choices are. So with that, I'm going to close out of the polls and we'll go into uh, the webinar. Here's uh, the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start out with an overview of some of the water level monitoring options just to give you a, a kind of a big picture. And then I'm going to go through uh, this little eight-step guide for selecting a water level logger or station that I, that I created that uh, hopefully uh, uh, simplifies uh, your, uh, your the process. Then I'll give you a little bit of information about Onset's Hobo uh, water level loggers and stations so you can see specifically what we have to offer and that'll give you a good starting point for uh, what's uh, what's available out there in the market and as I mentioned there'll be time for questions and answers but I will also uh, take questions as we go. So the uh, starting point uh, I think I mentioned this up front is there's a lot of choices out there it's uh, and, and during the years I've been in this business I've been seeing more and more choices which is good uh, but it does make it uh, a little more complicated because you have to decide which is best for you. Um, just uh, a little bit of a, an analogy uh, is, uh, I guess a lot of us are working from home now is uh, we're keeping our social distancing. And, um, and one of the things uh, that I've heard a lot of people are doing more of is uh, cooking. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are spending more time cooking now. Well, for uh, Mother's Day, I decided to make my uh, wife uh, eggs Benedict, which is something I haven't made before. I've enjoyed them, but never made them. So what, what did I do? I went on the internet, looked up a recipe. Uh, so following the recipe, I was able to, to do it. And they came, they came out pretty good. Well, I think, you no, know, maybe I'm a little biased. And, and my wife didn't seem to mind them either. But uh, today I'm gonna give you a recipe of sorts for choosing water level loggers. So hopefully this kind of makes it a little, you know, a little simpler. And even if you've been doing uh, and using water level loggers, uh, as with cooking recipes, it sometimes helps to go back and see, you know, what some of the tricks that other people have used. You know, maybe uh, uh, your holiday sauce came out a little bit lumpy the last time you made it for your eggs Benedict. Well, maybe there's some tricks to uh, to make it smoother next time. So hopefully I can share some tricks with you today that uh, uh, help uh, make your uh, holiday sauce nice and, uh, and nice and smooth. Um, and that's uh, that's kind of the analogy I'm going to use is uh, as I'm going to give you a recipe of sorts. First, I'm going to start with uh, the uh, the uh, options at the high level. The uh, how I break them down is to re, uh, remote loggers and stations. These are stations that uh, you can access through the internet. Uh, then there's what I call the standalone data loggers. Uh, they're either self-contained loggers like the one I show there in the middle, or it can be a uh, direct read uh, water level logger um, uh, as I show on the, on the right. Um, and I, I actually didn't say that in, in the introduction, but that is actually me deploying that logger there. So I, I practice what I preach. <laughs> so let me go into a little bit more detail in terms of each of those. So, oh, I do see one of you asked if this is recording. We are recording. So everything is, uh, is being recorded so in case you missed that in the, in the introduction. All right. Um, so remote water level loggers and stations. Uh, most of them communicate via the web, uh, and they're a great way to see what the current conditions are through the web without having to go out to the site. Another important aspect of remote water level stations is that they can give you uh, alarm notifications when critical limits are exceeded, you know, especially important things like flood warning and, and applications like that. They also give you a convenient way of downloading the data from your remote sites without having to go out to those sites. Uh, common communications options are cellular, Wi-Fi, satellite, and more. Uh, cost, just to give you a sense, they're, they're 
that start to around 1100 US dollars uh, plus a data plan. So uh, they're not the, the least expensive option, but they've got a lot of advantages and we'll talk about those advantages. Self-contained water level loggers are, are the simplest uh, and the easiest to deploy because they, they build in the data logging and sensing uh, capability all into that one uh, nice uh, compact package. Um, makes them very reliable when you're, they're that simple. There's not much that can go wrong. So I would have to say that self-contained uh, data loggers are the most reliable inherently. And they also are the, the least expensive with prices starting around $300. Uh, direct read water level loggers are also standalone loggers, but they have the added convenience of being able to read them out from the surface. Um, uh, so you don't have to pull up the, the logger from the water to read out the data. It's um, connected uh, with a cable to the, you know, between the sensor and the readout head. Uh, then you can read out the, um, the logger at the top with um, either a cable, some of them are plug-in, some of them have Bluetooth offload, it really depends upon the brand as to what your readout option is. Um, and those kind of uh, are a little bit more expensive than this, the completely self-contained loggers. They start around uh, $500 US, so kind of an in-between price. So that's kind of an overview. Let me jump into uh, my, uh, my recipe for the eight steps for uh, selecting a water level logger or station. So first question you, you, you want to ask yourself is, do I need remote access or not? As, as you saw, the, the price for remote access is a little bit higher. Uh, so what would be some reasons why you want to, uh, to pay that premium uh, to get remote access? So what are some of the reasons? Uh, one of the, the biggest reasons is alarm notifications. The alarm notifications can be to a smartphone, it can be an email, there's a lot of different ways uh, you can get those alarm notifications. Uh, and these basically tell you that critical limits have been reached, uh, which is really important for applications uh, such as flood warning or um, you know, any sort of a lot of water management applications. You really need to know when critical levels have been reached. Uh, one case is if you're uh, needing to take water samples. You know, you get a, a rain event and you need to go out and take some samples. You can uh, either be notified based on perhaps rain uh, um, fall amounts that have fallen or a certain water level has been reached. And then you can go out in the field and, and get the water samples you need. And another advantage of alarm notifications is it can tell you if you have a system problem. You know, of course, depends upon the, uh, the station uh, that you're using, but many of them have the capability to tell you if there's a uh, missed... Um, yeah, connection. If it's you know for some reason the connection's been broken, it can tell you if there's sensor errors. They can uh, uh, tell you that, that there's a problem out there. So you can go out there and fix the the system and minimize any uh, uh, loss of data. So another reason uh, or advantage of remote access is it allows you to see the current conditions uh, and trends. So you can say you know what is you know, at any time of the day, wherever you have internet access, you know, from your phone or from your desktop, and you want to see what the current water levels are, you can uh, log into your account and see see what they are, and you can see whether they're going up, going down. Uh, it can be very reassuring to uh, to know uh, uh, what's happening out there. Um, as I mentioned briefly before, you can also save time and the cost of having to go out to your sites. You know, I know a lot of users, uh, uh, especially if you're in consulting, uh, you'll have sites that are spread around the state or you know, it could be a, an hour to drive to uh, to get your data. Uh, but if you've got a remote access system, you can just uh, log in, download your data. Uh, most systems will allow you to aggregate your data all in one place so you can actually offload the data from multiple stations uh, at one time. Uh, it saves you a lot of time, and uh, you know, as we all know, time is money. Another advantage of uh, remote access stations is because the data is on the internet, you can easily share that data with others. You know, some uh, programs will allow you to set up like a dashboard where you can um, uh, share the, that dashboard with other users so they can see what's happening. You can see, you know, 
you know, organizations like the USGS, for example, they have a whole network of, uh, of water level monitoring stations around the country, and you can log into their network and, and see what the conditions are. So, you know, they've uh, enabled public access. That's uh, uh, all using uh, remote uh, monitoring stations. So that's a pretty, pretty powerful way of being able to share the data. Um, and some remote monitoring stations also allow you to connect other sensors, such as rainfall. Uh, for example, if you're looking uh, to, to trigger water sampling off of rainfall, you can connect that into the same station and, uh, and, and get an alarm notification on that. So just uh, continuing on with the remote access uh, uh, theme, uh, some of the options for uh, communications are, uh, and these are ways that the data gets from the station to the internet. Uh, cellular is very popular. Satellite is needed for some of the more remote uh, sites. Uh, a lot of cases you can have a wireless uh, station communicating to a, a gateway that's plugged into the uh, ethernet. Um, uh, there's also uh, more specialized networks like the alert uh, network, which is used for uh, uh, flood warning uh, and flood management. Uh, that's uh, a very critical uh, network. Um, and um, uh, with uh, radio transmitters, the central towers which are connected to the internet. Um, one of the things to keep in mind when you're using any sort of wireless transmission uh, to the internet is that those wireless signals will not go through metal. So if you look at the picture I have over there on the right, uh, you might not be able to get through that um, metal stilling well. So you need to have an external uh, antenna in that case to be able to transmit that data uh, wirelessly to uh, the receiving tower uh, or to the cellular network, whatever the case may be. So um, uh, keep that in mind. The other option is to have a plastic enclosure or a composite enclosure around your uh, water level station because uh, fortunately wireless will go through uh, plastic very easily. Uh, another case that we hear a lot is um, uh, stations deployed uh, in manholes or um, in, um, uh, uh, subsurface monitoring wells. Uh, if you want the wireless signals to go through those covers, you, you need to have some sort of composite uh, cover on the, the monitoring well for the signal to go through. Uh, there are also some stations that actually have antennas that connect to the manhole cover, but that's, that's getting pretty specialized to do that. Um, let's see, alarm notifications. Uh, some features, this is kind of um, features to look for when you're looking at systems where alarm notifications are critical in your application. Uh, you'll want to look for stations that have uh, uh, the alarm detection within the station itself, as opposed to uh, waiting for the data to be uploaded to the internet to check for the uh, uh, alarm conditions, especially if it's a system like a satellite system that might only be offloading the data every hour due to cost constraints. Well, if you can detect the alarms within the station, uh, then you can generate an alarm immediately and not have to wait for the next hourly upload. So uh, if you're looking for uh, uh, time response in, in your alarm notifications. You'll want to look for a station that has that capability within the station itself. Um, you'll also want to look for the ability to set multiple levels of alarms. You know, sometimes you might want to just kind of get a warning uh, notification um, when it gets to a certain level to start watching a little more closely. And then if things get a little more critical, you might have a wider distribution list, uh, uh, perhaps send a, a notification to the manager um, that it's time to take action. So you need a system that can handle those multiple alarm levels. And then you want to look at what uh, notification options uh, are available, text messages, email. Uh, some people like to be notified via uh, landline phones. And there are services out there that can take uh, basically text messages and translate that to a, a landline call. So that's a, an internet service you can you can uh, use if necessary. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, system alarms uh, are important as well. If you're counting on your system, giving you an alarm notification, but your system stops communicating for some reason, you need to know that. <laughs> so you, uh, you really want to, in that case, look for a system that has uh, missed connection alarms to tell you that, hey, something's going wrong with your communications. You need to go out there and, and check your site to make sure that uh, uh, things are okay and make sure that there's not an alarm condition that you need to know about. Let's see, I'm just popping over here to the questions. Um, okay, um, I'll come back to the, there's a question over here I'll come back to. Um, the, another uh, thing to consider with remote access systems is some of the other sensors you might want to connect. Uh, rainfall is real common in combination with water level. Wind, especially if you're looking at the effect of waves, you might want to understand uh, the wind conditions as well as the, the water level conditions uh, leading perhaps to a, a storm surge or a high tide. Uh, temperature is often of interest, other weather parameters. Uh, remote access systems also quite often have uh, inputs for other types of water level sensors. Uh, mostly I'm going to be talking today about pressure-based water level sensors because that's, that's what we sell and we know the best, but there's also uh, ultrasonic sensors and radar there's, uh, there's bubblers, there's all sorts of different types of water level sensors, and um, uh, those can be connected to remote access stations as well. Um, so, um, you know, keep that in mind. And we support some of those options as well. So I'm gonna pop over to the questions here, uh, because I see one that I think might be interesting, is uh, what would be the best option for a monitoring water level in a river that goes through a community and providing the data openly for anyone in the community to see. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I've worked with uh, customers uh, doing ex exactly that. And and that, uh, what you want to look for is a system that, uh, there, well, there's two ways of approaching it. Probably the easiest way to do that is to look for a system that has a public access system, and, and which, which ours does, which is just the ability for uh, the system to provide a link that you can embed in uh, websites that you create. So let's say you've got a, a community website which has you know news, garage sales, and whatever. And uh, on that, you can have a link to uh, your uh, station that's monitoring the water level, so that they can click on that link at any time from your website and go see the current water level conditions. And you can see graphs of you know what's happened over the last day, last week. Uh, and it's pretty easy to set that up with your modern remote access uh, systems. So um, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty pretty powerful capability. So good question. So uh, that was uh, remote access. Now I'm going to go to the other case. Let's say you don't need remote access or you can't afford it, and you're you're thinking, well, I'm really better uh, suited with uh, standalone loggers. So what you have to do then is you decide, well, do I want to just go for the simple self-contained uh, standalone logger, or should I look at uh, uh, direct readout loggers? Well, I'm going to give you the advantages of each. The self-contained ones are the most durable because there's no cables or connections to worry about. So definitely the maximum durability. They're also the easiest to hide. Uh, you can easily deploy them on the bottom of a, the body of water, your stream or your, your lake, uh, and, and nobody knows that they're there. They can be attached to a cement block and there's nothing visible above the water uh, uh, that tells somebody that there's a logger down there. And then, then you just have to dive down or maybe that cement block is attached to a rope and you can pull it back up. It, it is tricky sometimes uh, uh, recovering those loggers that are deployed under the water, but um, uh, they're very secure down there. In other cases, I've had people attaching loggers to um, uh, lobster traps. That's another way of, <laughs> of conveniently uh, being able to retrieve uh, a water level logger that's deployed on the bottom. Uh, buoys is another approach. But then if you've got a buoy there, uh, that's a little more visible. So that kind of defeats the purpose of hiding it. Um, another advantage of self-contained uh, standalone loggers is they are the lowest cost. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can get them uh, for prices starting under $300. And that's especially important if you need to monitor uh, multiple locations. Let's say you're monitoring the, a stream and you're monitoring it at 10 different locations along the stream. As long as you're within 10 miles of a central barometric pr uh, pressure logger, um, you can you just need to buy uh, 10 of those standalone loggers, one barometric pressure logger, and it makes a very affordable uh, solution. Uh, another advantage of the self-contained loggers is they're uh, uh, nice and compact. Um, if you need to backpack out to a location to deploy your loggers, uh, it's a lot easier to fit these in than any sort of cabled logger. So. Uh, uh, especially like this this one I'm showing here, it's got a uh, polypropylene housing. It's really lightweight, very easy to backpack out to a, a site with a bunch of these. So the other uh, type of self-contained loggers are the um, uh, uh, ones we call direct read or direct readout loggers. And the advantage of these is, is it saves time by avoiding having to pull up the loggers each time. So if you've got a bunch of them out there deployed and you need to efficiently get the data off of them, um, it, 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 these are the, you know, these will save you time. And uh, you know, time is money, so it's it's worth uh, worth having the you know the the, uh, the cabled sensor uh, to save that time. Especially again, if you're a consultant, that that time is especially valuable. And Let's see. Yeah, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the advantages of the direct readout uh, later on as well. It's um, such as uh, it allows you to deploy them in harder to access locations because you can get things like wireless offload. So that's uh, uh, another advantage potentially of self or direct readout loggers. Um, when you're looking at these, you want to look for one that has uh, integrated barometric pressure sensor, so you don't need uh, a separate barometric pressure logger. So that helps uh, keep the cost down and making them more convenient to use. Another factor and um, step three in uh, my recipe is uh, uh, for standalone loggers, you want to look at the readout method uh, to choose a, a method that's going to be most convenient uh, for you. Uh, some uh, data loggers have an electrical connection where you have to plug a cable into a logger. Uh, generally, I would recommend against that because the electronics of the logger should, you don't want to expose them to uh, uh, outdoor environments if you don't have to. Uh, so especially if it's rainy when you're going out and offloading the data from loggers, you don't want to have to be opening them up when they're dripping wet and plug it in a cable. That's uh, asking for potential problem. So uh, tend to avoid that. Uh, optical readout, um, which is pretty common in water level loggers, is a much better option, uh, but you need a, a base station in that case, or uh, some of them also have battery powered uh, waterproof data shuttles, um, which you can use to offload the data from those loggers. That's probably the most reliable and easiest way to offload uh, uh, loggers with optical readout. And the nice thing there is the optics you know, can communicate through a waterproof case, so you don't have to be opening it up out there in the field. Another uh, option is a Bluetooth readout. You're starting to see more options with that. And uh, that's uh, uh, the easiest, really, I think, because you can go out with like a mobile device, your smartphone or an iPad um, and uh, offload the data. And specifically for Bluetooth readout, you probably want to look for uh, what we call Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE uh, because that doesn't need a button push to turn on the communications. It's a low power Bluetooth technology that's just constantly uh, you know, sending out signals. Um, uh, that means that as soon as you walk within range within your with your mobile device, you can see that logger and uh, off, you know, connect to it and offload to it without having to actually push a button on the logger. Uh, so that's, that's easier than kind of what I call old style Bluetooth. Um, let's see, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I got distracted here by a question. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna come back to this. There's a question on the longest cable 
uh, you can sell with a direct readout loggers. Uh, it really depends on, on the brand. Uh, the longest cables that we sell with our direct readout loggers are, I think, 400 uh, meters, you know, which covers a pretty wide range. You get pretty long cable with that. Uh, now, we do have occasionally requests from people that need to go even deeper, but you can get a pretty long cable on, on direct readout uh, uh, loggers. Um, so, so, I'm sorry. I'm easily distracted. Let me come back to this slide. Uh, another factor to consider when you're looking at standalone loggers is are there other loggers that you need as well? You know, for example, do you need to monitor conductivity or dissolved oxygen? In that case, you may want to look for a family of loggers, which uses the common uh, readout method so that you can read all of them out with the same data offload device and the same software, look at the data together. So um, uh, if you've got uh, needs to monitor multiple parameters, uh, you probably want to look for a family that includes a water level logger. So step four in my recipe is, uh, do you want to use a vented sensor for water level or a non-vented? Now this applies to uh, pressure-based uh, water level sensors. And if you're using a pressure-based water level sensor, you need to compensate for changes in barometric pressure. And the reason for that is uh, those uh, barometric pressure changes translate to six inches to maybe up to a foot of water level change if you go, you know, you're looking at some of the more extreme storm events. So, yeah, you really do, for accurate water level measurements, need to compensate for barometric pressure changes. And there's two ways to do this. One is to have a vent tube from the sensor in the water, and that vent tube goes up to the atmosphere. Um, and that's what the, that top sensor is that I'm showing. Um, the, when you use a vent, vented um, sensor like this, you have to be really careful not to get any moisture into that vent tube. So usually they have some sort of desiccant pack or maybe a bellows at the surface that keeps moisture from getting into that vent tube because that uh, moisture can uh, cause problems. And basically, if, if you get a, like a, a drop of moisture down there, a few drops of moisture, that can translate to a few inches of water level at the bottom of the vent tube. So that would throw off your measurements by that much. The other approach is to use a separate barometric pressure logger and then, then to have software uh, from the vendor that takes the data from your in-water uh, water level logger, combines it with that barometric pressure data, and calculates what the, the differential pressure is, and uses that to calculate your water level. And it sounds complicated, but if you've got uh, the right software, it's actually pretty easy to do. So let me talk briefly about the, the advantages of each. Um, uh, vented loggers can theoretically have better accuracy because you have just one uh, pressure sensor, so you only have to worry about the accuracy of that one pressure sensor uh, in terms of looking at the um, accuracy of your overall measurement. Um, but again, depends upon the specifications of that particular sensor. The um, uh, other advantages uh, is if you're integrating into a station, it can be a little easier to use a, um, a vented sensor uh, because it's just one sensor you have to integrate into your station. Uh, one analog output, a 4 to 20 milliamp output, which um, uh, you have to deal, to deal with. Non-vented loggers, uh, they tend to be more reliable uh, and easier to deploy. Uh, the reliability comes from the fact you don't have to worry about the vent tube or water getting into that. Uh, you don't have to worry about that cable, so that's what makes them easier to deploy. Uh, they're just smaller and more compact. And if you use good deployment methods, you can get pretty good accuracy with your non-vented loggers as well. It turns out the ones that we sell uh, are all uh, non-vented. Uh, well, for the most part, we do actually do sell one, one vented uh, family of, of sensors as well, but most of our loggers are, are uh, non-vented loggers. So, next thing you want to look at in your selection process is accuracy. Um, 
some factors to look for in your accuracy of your uh, water level loggers is you, you need to make sure you're looking at the total accuracy. And if you're looking at a water level sensor with an analog output, you, in addition to the accuracy of the sensor, you have to add in the potential error of the analog to digital conversion. So this really applies more to your station type loggers. So you have to add those two uh, error terms together to get your total accuracy. So let's keep that in mind. If you're looking at a non-vented sensor, um, you actually have to add the error term of the in-water sensor as well as the barometric pressure sensor. So you got to keep that in mind as well. So if each one of them has a 0.05% uh, error, you got to add the two of them together to get a potential error of 0.1%. So make sure you're doing that. You also want to look at temperature compensation. Most modern uh, water level loggers and sensors do have temperature compensation built into them, uh, but some vendors do it better uh, than others. So definitely want to look at, uh, at that when you're evaluating uh, your, your choices. So this graph over there just compares uh, the amount of error over temperature for um, uh, different brands of water level sensors. Where the in this particular test, where the green line. <laughs> um, and that's another thing you want to look at is the the vendor's reputation for um, uh, for quality and uh, in in for providing honest specifications. Uh, you know, some some vendors uh, uh, you know use kind of creative specsmanship to. <laughs> To, uh, to state their accuracy, so it may appear better than it actually is in the real world. So, uh, you know, you know, look for you know vendors that uh, that really do stand behind the specifications that they that they say. Uh, that's that's important. Some deployment tips because uh, you are part of the equation for getting the best accuracy. So there's some things you can do to help your cause. So here's just a few tips. That's not really the focus of this webinar, but I'm going to throw a few of these points out there. Um, one of them is, uh, keeping a stable temperature environment for both your water level logger, as well as your barometric pressure logger is important. So if you, um, uh, if you're deploying a separate barometric pressure, Logger, it's good to deploy that below ground level because the temperature is going to be more stable down there than it is in the air, and that'll help your overall accuracy. And certainly, whatever you do, don't put your barometric pressure sensor in direct sunshine uh, because that's uh, going to cause it to to go through more temperature changes, and that can add additional error. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, using an accurate reference water level measurement uh, at the beginning of deployment uh, and i recommend taking one at the end of, of each deployment segment as well uh, that that's important because you'll use that to uh, uh, enter into the software to calculate the water level for all your data so if that uh, initial reference water level measurement is off by an inch all your measurements are going to be off by an inch so make sure you get a good one <laughs> Um, yeah, mount the water level sensor so that it's not going to be shifting around, typically in some sort of stilling well. If you're mounting it on a cement block that's in the water, for example, you want to uh, use zip ties to secure the, the, the logger in place so that it's not shifting around, potentially causing errors in your, your measurements. Um, another uh, thing that, that helps uh, is to use software that counts for water density, uh, which is a function of uh, the salinity of the water. So uh, moving on to physical considerations when you're choosing a uh, water level logger, here's some things to look for. Uh, one important thing is if you're deploying in salt water, you need to have a water level logger that's rated for salt water. Uh, so you need to uh, look for materials that will hold up in salt water. Titanium or polypropylene will hold up in, uh, well in salt water. Uh, a, a lot of manufacturers will offer 
uh, two versions of their water level loggers, one in a stainless steel for freshwater applications, and then another version in titanium for um, uh, saltwater deployments. Uh, stainless steel does not uh, hold up well uh, over extended periods in, in saltwater, so um, keep that in mind. Uh, polypropylene fortunately does hold up well in saltwater or freshwater. Uh, Another factor is the sensor itself. Ceramic sensors within the logger uh, are, are probably best for saltwater deployments. Uh, the ones that are, some loggers have stainless steel sensors, and again, those won't hold up well in saltwater for, for long term. Uh, if you're in waterways that might freeze, you know, we have uh, a lot of people that are using them in streams that uh, the beginning of the season, end of the season, they might freeze. Uh, look for a logger that has a ceramic sensor because those are really robust and will hold up in those streams. Another factor is if you're deploying in wells, uh, make sure the diameter of the logger fits within uh, your wells, so keep that in mind. And that leads me to another poll question. Uh, good chance to get you guys involved as well. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, if uh, this only applies to those of you who are applying uh, water level loggers in some sort of wells. Um, what is the diameter of those wells? So let me uh, bring that up. The ones that aren't deploying in wells, you can uh, take this moment to breathe and watch what other people are doing. So here's the different answers. So um, when he, if you are using wells, if you could indicate which uh, size wells you have. So uh, oh, a lot of them, uh, it's a good number are uh, larger than four inches. So that's, uh, so you've got plenty of room. I'm gonna give you another second. Um, before I close this out. I'll share the results. Oh, sorry, one of you said that you couldn't select the options. Sorry for that, I'm not sure why. If you weren't able to enter in your choice uh, for some reason, you can just enter it into the questions box and uh, let me know that way, that would be useful. Um, so um, uh, so yeah, if you've got multiple, you know, I see you're doing that, great. You know, if you've got multiple ranges, perfect. And I really appreciate your inputs on that. And uh, let's see, let me share the results just so you can see uh, what your fellow attendees, 37% uh, are larger than four inches, 15, uh, four inch wells, two inch wells uh, are also up there, 37%. And then a few of you are, are in the smaller wells as well. So, all right, well, thanks for that. Um, let me, yep. So another thing you want to be looking at as you're evaluating water level loggers is the depth range and uh, pressure-based sensors. Everybody offers, uh, or most everybody, let's say, offers uh, a few different choices. And uh, the, the better you can match your range, the better the accuracy you'll, you'll get. So uh, you want to figure out how much range you need and then uh, you know, go with kind of the minimum range that you need. Although sometimes if you're not sure, you have to go to the next bigger range just to be sure if you're uh, deploying in a new new area where you don't have a lot of history. Um, so let's look at this. Yeah, so I just did a little diagram here. One of the things to keep in mind in terms of your range is the range of change of your water level that you're interested in. It's not the, the range below the surface of the ground. It's you need to figure out what your minimum water level is, your maximum water level is, and what is the range of that change. Then you deploy the water level logger just below the minimum level, and then it's able to detect uh, changes over that, that range. So um, one of the other ways you might deploy them though is if you're deploying on the bottom of a body of water, uh, then you need to uh, accommodate the full column of water above uh, that uh, that logger. So in that case, um, uh, 
uh, you need to, may need to go to a, um, a bigger range than your change because you've, you're in deeper water. So you need to make sure that's covered as well. Next consideration, and this is the last of the, the steps in my little recipe, is the uh, uh, software. If you're using pressure-based sensors, uh, you need to make sure that the uh, software can do the barometric compensation and conversion to water level. Uh, otherwise, it's you can do it on your own, but it's a lot easier if your software does it. And if you need flow, there's some software that will do the conversion from water level to flow. So if that's a factor in your, your applications, look for that. And we know, don't ignore that, uh, no worries. The, um, uh, a lot of you are, are taking the data from your data loggers, using it other places. Uh, so uh, look for compatibility with other programs such as Excel or R, GIS modeling software. If you're looking at a remote monitoring system and tying it into uh, a network, you may want compatibility with something like Aquarius or DataWise. So, so keep that in mind as well. So um, this is a quick summary of uh, the recipe uh, for uh, uh, choosing a water level logger. And you'll even notice I put a little box around it to make it look like a recipe card. Now I may be dating myself uh, uh, talking about recipe cards, but uh, this is a quick summary of the steps remote access or not. Uh, for standalone, decide whether you need self-contained or direct read. Um, look at the readout method, vented or non-vented, accuracy, physical considerations, depth range, and software. So it's, it's really not too bad. Um, it's really not too bad. Hopefully uh, some of these uh, uh, things will, will help make that whole process easier. So, Um, I'm going to, I'm actually falling a little bit behind here. I've been a little long winded. Sorry for that. I want to tell you some, uh, quick information about, uh, uh, Hobo's water level loggers. I think this will give you a good sense for what's available out there. Uh, so I, th I think it's, this is worthwhile. Um, so Onset does offer this full range, uh, from, uh, standalone, uh, loggers on the left over to the, uh, the remote monitoring stations on the right. So our U20 series, uh, they have our standalone loggers with optical readout. Um, our MX2001 series, uh, they have direct read with Bluetooth readout. Uh, and then we have our micro RX and RX3000 stations, which um, uh, are web enabled stations. So you can get your data remotely and get your alarm notifications remotely. You can see how the prices compare. So, you know, for the uh, down in the, the bottom row there, uh, uh, $300 uh, for the standalone U20 series loggers, up to uh, around $1,500 for the RX3000 stations. Uh, that's including the sensor and the cabling and the, the, the station. Um, so, let me, I'm going to look at each of those in a little bit more detail. Again, I'm going to have to talk fast. Sorry. Uh, so U20 series, uh, the basic U20 series, uh, stainless steel or titanium, uh, 495 or 595, got the best accuracy. Then we have our U20L series with uh, similar performance, but in a polypropylene housing um, and uh, an, a nice low price of under $300. Uh, for both of these uh, series of, of loggers, uh, they're self-contained, non-vented loggers. Uh, they both have optical USB interfaces uh, for uh, reading out the loggers. So they're compatible with our waterproof shuttle for, uh, for easy and reliable field uh, offload. They've got a um, ceramic sensors, so they uh, both tolerate being frozen. Of course, when they're frozen, they're not going to give you accurate water level measurements, but uh, once they thaw out, they can revert back to uh, providing you the water level data that you're looking for. Uh, they have depth ratings up to 76 meters, uh, 250 feet. And um, we have our Hoboware Pro software, which does the uh, barometric compensation and uh, conversion to 
uh, water level. Our MX uh, 2001 water level loggers uh, have Bluetooth readout, uh, and it's the BLE style, so you don't have to push a button on the logger. Uh, this means you can easily offload the data uh, with your smartphone or tablet. It's a, a free app we call uh, Hobo Mobile that you can use to uh, to read out the data from these. Uh, if it's in a plastic well cap, you can read out the data without even having to open up the well cap. Uh, the logger does include a barometric pressure sensor, so there's no need uh, for a separate barometric uh, logger. Um, and that means it can provide the water level data directly. When you first deploy the logger, you enter in the reference water level reading, and then it uses that to calculate uh, the water level data that it logs and stores. And um, it does have uh, two versions of the sensors, one for fresh water made with stainless steel and, and um, uh, PVC materials, and then it has another version that uses titanium and PVC materials. Uh, prices are starting at $5.95 for the sensor and the logger together. Cables uh, start at $74. You can order them at a wide range of lengths. Um, an advantage of having the wireless offload is you can uh, deploy them in different wells within your environment and uh, offload the data as long as you're within 100 feet uh, without having to go tromping through the uh, the saltwater marshes that you're trying to study and protect. Uh, or if it's uh, perhaps down a stream embankment that uh, it's hard to get access to, you can uh, offload that data without having to climb down that with that, uh, the Bluetooth communications. So those are our standalone loggers. Now I'm going to shift gears to our web-enabled uh, stations. We offer the Hobo Micro RX water level station that has cellular communications built into it. Uh, it's also got a built-in solar panel or battery-powered options. Uh, you can uh, upload data as uh, frequently as every 10 minutes to the internet so you can see the data in, in near real time. Uh, it does have uh, pre-programmed water flow formulas. I saw somebody asking about those. We have formulas in there for calculating flow for common weirs and flumes, as well as stage discharge uh, uh, tables. You can enter into the uh, the software for getting flow. And um, I should mention, I don't know if I mentioned it later in this slide, but I've also done a webinar on um, uh, specifically a monitoring flows with water level loggers. So uh, look for that in our library of, of webinars if you're, if you're interested in monitoring flows. Um, the Micro RX has in-station alarms uh, for triggering immediate uh, notifications. Uh, it uses non-vented sensors. It actually has two sensors, one that's in the station, which records barometric pressure, and then has the other that's down in the water. And uh, that, uh, provides the best reliability, but still provides the advantage of being able to get differential water pressure and water level directly. Um, these stations also have inputs for five of Onset's smart sensors for various weather parameters, temperature, rain, wind, etc. cetera. Uh, it's got multiple sensor ranges as well, up to 76 meters. That's kind of been our traditional uh, limit in most cases. Um, saltwater versions of the sensors as well. And the prices for these start at a uh, little under $1,100. That includes the sensor, the cable, uh, you know, a shorter cable. Um, and data plans start at $150 per year. And then for more expandability, we offer the Hobo RX3000 remote monitoring stations. They have the ability to connect uh, up to two water level sensors. They have more communications options, cellular, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet options. Uh, it's got more smart sensor inputs, and it's also got optional modules for like analog inputs. If you want to connect a ultrasonic or radar water level sensor, it's also got some uh, um, a module that can talk to our wireless sensors. 
um, for for, for um, weather parameters, and it's also got a re relay control module option. So, I as I said, I went a little long. That was um, I wanted to get through those slides. Um, I now have time for a few questions, so I'm going to go in, and uh, I saw a few questions come in here, and some of them I was able to address as we went along. Um, there's a question here on, uh, do we publish long-term stability specs for the standalone water level pressure loggers? How we address that is uh, sensors will change over time and it's hard to predict exactly how long that they will last but we we specify a drift specification which gives you a sense for how much it can change over time so typically drift is specified as a certain amount uh, per year and within a year it usually won't change that much now pressure sensors are pretty stable so they don't change that much so um, fortunately the drifts, you know, so for water level measurements, it's pretty stable, but it's good to, to get out there, check, enter another water level reference reading. The, every time you enter in a new water level reading, uh, reference reading, that'll adjust for any drift in the sensor. So it's like recalibrating the sensor. So we do recommend that. Uh, got a question here on how long does the MX2001 battery last? Uh, say uh, 15 minutes and one hour logging. Um, it uh, we specify that as long as you're logging, I guess at a minute rate or slower, it'll last for a year uh, off of its batteries. And those batteries are uh, user replaceable. So every year you can go out and replace those batteries um, and get another year. The batteries on our stations are they're charged by solar panels, so they kind of go for several years before they eventually wear out and need to be replaced. The U20 loggers, they have a five-year battery life in those, and uh, those, are, those are actually not user replaceable, but uh, you can get five years out of them. Um, I'm going to, what I'm gonna do, just because of the time, there's a quick couple things, I, slides I wanna wrap up. So I'm gonna go through those wrap-up slides and then what I'm going to do is open it up for question and answers because I'm happy to stay on for another uh, 10, you know, 15 minutes, whatever, to answer some of the questions we can. So I'm going to go through those couple of wrap-up slides. Then I will come back to your questions. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. So uh, thanks for uh, <laughs> uh, being flexible with me, kind of going with the flow. These days, everybody's got to, uh, yeah, doing things differently. Oops. So. So what, the wrap-up questions, first off, I want to say is our website, this is for those of you who don't have a chance to, to hang on for further questions, our website is a great resource. It's got a lot of information. It's got webinars like this webinar. It's got tutorials on uh, using our software. Uh, it's got all our specifications and pricing. So definitely uh, get to know this uh, web address, onsetcomp.com, uh, a wealth of knowledge. Um, uh, we are also, we've got our application specialist, uh, even though a lot of us are working from home, uh, we're answering the phones, uh, give us a call at any time. We're happy to uh, talk to you, answer any questions you have. So call us by phone, uh, send us an email at, uh, at sales at onsetcomp.com. And for technical support, for those of you who have products already, uh, we recommend you go to this uh, web address and, um, uh, you know, contact us through that. This, this gives us a little bit more information as you send in your, your technical questions, so you can use that as well. So lots of ways you can reach us. And I actually, this is a little uh, bit of a quick question I wanted to get your inputs on before I lose you. Um, I, I saw that quite a few of you, I think around 40% of you were doing remote monitoring. And I just wanted to get your inputs on how frequently uh, do you need to uh, to have that online data updated. Are you looking at this stuff in kind of pseudo real time or is, if you get a daily upload, is that good enough? So I'm gonna uh, ask you this question and, and ask for your inputs. Um, 
And I really appreciate you hanging in there and sharing uh, your inputs on this. This is a question we often have internally is uh, how, um, how often, uh, uh, how real time you really need to be. So your inputs on this uh, will help guide some of our future products and just uh, give us a better sense for where you're coming from. So I'm gonna leave this open for another Okay, it looks like it's slowed down, so I'm going to close it out at this point. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. I'll share the results. You guys went through the trouble of sharing that, so I'm going to share share that. Looks like about almost half of you uh, daily uploads are, are enough. And then it's pretty evenly quarterly or, uh, or quarters between the rest, <laughs> every four hours, uh, every hour, about a quarter need every 10 minutes. Um, and, and so many of you need it when there's an alarm condition, which makes a lot of sense. That's kind of when it gets critical. It's uh, you know, we got a, uh, something's happening out there. I, I need to uh, to get the latest data. So uh, thank you for that. So oh, you know all of the above. That's good. I like that. <laughs> so I'm going to have one more slide, and this is just kind of for those of you who have to go. I want to really thank you for uh, your time today. I really appreciate it. And I know I went a little over time. Hopefully it was worth it. Um, and, and as you do sign out, uh, I want to ask you for a couple of things. Uh, one is to share your feedback so we can continue to make these uh, the webinars that are valuable to you and improve on them. Um, and also let us know if you'd like somebody from our, uh, our uh, uh, applications group or technical support group to follow up with you uh, to answer, you know, location specific questions, questions that are important to you. Uh, we're, we're happy to do that. So let us know if you'd like us to follow up. So as I said, uh, before I, I sign off, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stay on, answer a few more questions. But for those that you have to go, uh, I, I really do want to thank you for your time and uh, really appreciate you your participating and, and sharing some of your uh, your inputs as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, stay, uh, I wish all of you uh, safety and, and uh, and uh, keep things going through this uh, these weird times that we're going through. So so stay stay safe. So with that, I'm going to come back to questions. Um, so uh, yeah, let's see. Some of you are continuing to provide inputs. Thank you, really appreciate it. Uh, yep, we're going to send the recording for those of you looking for the recording. So I'm going to scan through here. Actually, it looks like we did a pretty good job of catching most of the questions. Some inputs for some smaller diameter sensors. That's that's uh, I know that's that's often needed. I think we're in pretty good shape. Oh, there's a question here about the um, life expense expectancy of the U20. I think I kind of covered that, but um, U20s, they um, they have a five-year battery life. Um, that's with a one-minute logging rate. Uh, if, uh, if you go out there and, and enter new reference water level readings, you'll get, you get that five years out of them safely or, or more. So they've got a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good service life. For the, the metal ones, we do offer a battery replacement service. So you can send them back to us uh, to have the batteries replaced because we know that you know those, uh, you, if you've paid over $500, that's a bit of investment. So we'll replace the batteries in those. I don't think we're offering a battery replacement service for our $300 loggers at this point because it's just, it costs us more to replace the battery and handling than it would be to, to get you a new logger. Um, Let's see, there's a question here about the U20L. Is it appropriate for estuarian waters? And absolutely, it's made out of uh, polypropylene, which, and it's got a ceramic sensor. So we have a ton of users that are, are using those in saltwater bays and uh, estuaries. So it's, it's very, um, uh, you know, very appropriate for deployment in those. So, so a good question to confirm, because yeah, you wanna make sure uh, when you buy these that it's gonna meet your environment. All right. I think we've done pretty good. 
Oh, here's a question. What if the water level drops below your minimum level in the well? Well, basically what's going to happen then is you're going to get a flat line at um, whatever, you know, basically at the zero water level point. As soon as it goes below, it's going to stop at that point. Now, it won't necessarily be zero feet because you've entered in a reference water level uh, that all the data is being adjusted to, but it'll, you, you know, you'll see when it, in, in um, title applications, you'll see this fairly often is, is uh, you know, maybe it, it dries out uh, where your water level logger is deployed. Uh, you'll see it just kind of levels off at that point. The, you, know, it, you know, it doesn't measure negative water levels at that point. So um, that's, a, that's a good question though. So I'm going to see if there's any more. Okay, here's a question. We're looking at remote monitoring the level of a small lake for flood purposes, envisioning a pipe standing in the lake with a logger and station. Do you sell such a pipe? Um, that's a good question. We, we actually don't sell uh, extended pipes. We actually do have a, um, um, uh, a small PVC pipe that will sell. Um, it's got an end cap on it. That, uh, you can attach to a cement block or uh, or a rock or something that's on the bottom of the water. That's about, I forget, it's about six inches long. So you could deploy the water level logger in that, but you have to be able to pull that up to offload the data. If you're in a lake, um, there's, a di there's a few different ways of deploying in a lake. One is to have a PVC pipe that kind of goes up the side of the lake uh to a stilling well that's uh you know above the lake surface that way you can um you know, push the logger down um to, to monitor water level then we want to pull up the data you can um you pull it up or if it's using a um a station you can uh, just leave it down there but the that stilling well will protect the cable uh protect the logger helps hold it in place so we recommend that and it can just be ordinary pvc pipe as long as you put poles or use a slotted PVC to allow the water into the pipe, you can do that. Uh, I'd recommend uh, slotted PVC uh, for, for a lake bottom to keep the silt out. You don't want to have silt collecting in the bottom of your stilling well. So, uh, so you know, uh, slotted PVC will usually, usually work pretty well for that. Um, and one of the nice things about pressure-based water level sensors is you don't need a perfectly vertical um, stilling well. That you can have that that um, stilling well go along the side of the stream or lake, and um, you get your measurements that way. So hopefully that uh, gives you a sense for how you can you know, mount those. Yeah, I think there's a couple of questions here. I think are fairly specific. I think we'll save those for our application specialist to follow up with you. Um, the tips on uh, maintaining, you know, just make sure you don't get silt into the sensors. You don't want to um, pressure sensors, you know, the loggers. You have to make sure that you uh, keep up with following so that you're uh, the access port to the water level sensor is not clogged at any point. So you got to be careful to keep silt out and following out of your water level sensor. So that's something to keep in mind. I think here's a question um, in freezing conditions. Uh, I mentioned using ceramic sensor units. Will these continue to collect data even in low temperatures? So if the water freezes and it's got a water level logger in it, what it's going to happen is it's going to, you know, the, the, the pressure of that ice is going to kind of squeeze the logger, but it's not going to give you valid water level measurements. It'll The logger will continue to record temperature and record the pressure that it's seeing, but it's not going to give you water level measurements. So you'll know that the water is frozen. So you'll, you'll know that it'll continue to log that information. And, um, and you'll know that it's getting some pressure on it, but you, you won't know what the water level is above it. As soon as the water thaws out and it gets back to normal water again, then it will continue to, to uh, record water level like you, like you expected. And, and it should really, in most cases, uh, preserve its calibration. So um, 
Yeah, that's a good way of finding, you know, the, looking at the water level right up into it's freezing and then afterwards. Now, here's a question. Uh, this is very specific to our products. Um, if you're, you know, is Hoboware Pro a must? Yes. Um, you, you want to use our Hoboware Pro because that includes the barometric compensation assistant for converting the, the pressure data to the water level data. So you, you don't absolutely need that, but I would strongly recommend using our software for doing that conversion. It just makes it easy. It's worth the, the small price you have to pay for the Hoboware Pro version. So, all right. Well, I think I'm going to let everybody go. I think uh, I've gotten through most of the questions. Really appreciate those that have hung in there with me to, uh, what are we, what is it, 12 after, the extra 12 minutes. So, appreciate your extra time. Hopefully, uh, it made it worthwhile. So, again, it's been really uh, a pleasure, my pleasure, uh, talking with all of you today. So, um, stay safe.